Preface to the Sexes in Science and History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Sexes in Science and History. An Inquiry into the Dogma of Woman's Inferiority to Man by Eliza Bird Gumbel. A revised edition of The Evolution of Woman. Preface to New Edition. This volume is a revised edition of The Evolution of Woman, published by G. P. Putnam's Sons in 1894. In this later work, much added evidence appears going to prove the correctness of the theory advanced in the former work. In it, the subject of sex development has been brought down to the present time, and in this later investigation it is found that each and every fact connected with the biological and sociological development of the last twenty years is in strict accord not only with the facts set forth in the evolution of woman, but with the conclusions therein arrived at. In the concluding chapters of this volume, the results of the separate development of the two diverging lines of sex demarcation are set forth. I have endeavored to show that present conditions are the legitimate outcome of the ascendancy gained during the later ages of human history by the egoistic or destructive agencies over the higher or constructive forces developed in human nature e b g preface to first edition after a somewhat careful study of written history and after an investigation extending over several years of all the accessible facts relative to extant tribes representing the various stages of human development I had reached the conclusion, as early as the year 1882, that the female organism is in no wise inferior to that of the male. For some time, however, I was unable to find any detailed proof that could consistently be employed to substantiate the correctness of this hypothesis. In the year 1885, with no special object in view other than a desire for information, I began a systematized investigation of the facts which at that time had been established by naturalists relative to the development of mankind from lower orders of life it was not however until the year eighteen eighty six after a careful reading of the descent of man by mr darwin that i first became impressed with the belief that the theory of evolution as enunciated by scientists furnishes much evidence going to show that the female among all the orders of life man included represents a higher stage of development than the male although at the time indicated the belief that man has descended from lower orders in the scale of being had been accepted by the leading minds both in europe and america for reasons which have not been explained scientists generally seemed inclined to ignore certain facts connected with this theory which tend to prove the superiority of the female organism scarcely considering at the outset whether my task would eventually take the form of a magazine article or whether it would be extended to the dimensions of a book i set myself to work to show that some of the conclusions of the savants regarding the subject of sex development are not in accord with their premises while writing the first part of this volume and while reasoning on the facts established by scientists in connection with the observations which have been made in these later years relative to the growth of human society and the development of human institutions it seemed clear to me that the history of life on the earth presents an unbroken chain of evidence going to prove the importance of the female and so struck was i by the manner in which the facts of science and those of history harmonize that i decided to embrace within my work some of the results of my former research I therefore set about the task of tracing, in a brief manner, the growth of the primary characters observed in the two diverging sex columns, according to the facts and principles enunciated in the theory of natural development. It is not perhaps singular, during an age dominated by theological dogmatism, and in which no definite knowledge relative to the development of life on the earth had been gained, that man should have regarded himself as an infinitely superior being neither is it remarkable that woman who was supposed to have appeared later on the scene of action than did her male mate and who owed her existence to a surgical operation performed upon him should have been regarded simply as an appendage a creature brought forth in response to the requirements of the masculine nature 
the above doctrines when enunciated by theologians need cause little surprise but with the dawn of a scientific age it might have been expected that the prejudices resulting from those doctrines might disappear when however we turn to the most advanced scientific writings of the present century we find that the prejudices which throughout thousands of years have been gathering strength are by no means eradicated and any discussion of the sex question is still rare in which the effects of these prejudices may not be traced even mr darwin notwithstanding his great breadth of mental vision and the important work which he accomplished in the direction of original inquiry whenever he had occasion to touch on the mental capacities of women or more particularly on the relative capacities of the sexes manifested the same spirit which characterizes the efforts of an earlier age and throughout his entire investigation of the human species his ability to ignore certain facts which he himself had used and which all along the line of development tend to prove the superiority of the female is truly remarkable we usually judge of a man's fitness to assume the role of an original investigator in any branch of human knowledge by noting his powers of observation and generalization and by observing his capacity to perceive connections between closely related facts also by tracing the various processes by which he arrives at his conclusions the ability however to collect facts and the power to generalize and draw conclusions from them avail little when brought into direct opposition to deeply rooted prejudices the indications are strong that the time has at length arrived when the current opinions concerning sex capacity and endowment demand a revision and when nothing short of scientific deductions untainted by the prejudices and dogmatic assumptions of the past will be accepted as has been stated the object of this volume is to set forth the principal data brought forward by naturalists bearing on the subject of the origin and development of the two lines of sexual demarcation and by means of the facts observed by explorers among peoples in the various stages of development to trace so far as possible the effect of such differentiation upon the individual and upon the subsequent growth of human society e b g end of the preface section one of the sexes in science and history by eliza bert gumbel this librivox recording is in the public domain part one the theory of evolution chapter one development of the organism sex is not only the basic fact underlying physical life but it is also the fundamental principle involved in the origin and development of religion throughout the history of mankind the god idea has ever been male or female according to the relative importance of the two sex principles in human affairs scientists declare that they are now able to trace the development of the two diverging lines of sex demarcation from the time of their separation or from the time when these principles were confined within one and the same individual in order to understand the origin of sex it becomes necessary to recall briefly the theory of the development of life on the earth as set forth by the savants as science deals only with matter a mechanical theory of the universe is inevitable as science is wholly materialistic it is perfectly consistent in its declaration that the senses and the intellect constitute the only means whereby truth may be discovered modern philosophy on the other hand which deals less with matter itself than with the causes which underlie the development of matter affirms that a character has been developed in human beings which in its capacity to discern truth far transcends the intellect that character is intuition but as we are dealing only with scientific observations philosophical speculations do not here concern us the fundamental idea which must necessarily lie at the bottom of all natural theories of development is that of a gradual development of all even the most perfect organisms out of a single or out of a very few quite simple and quite imperfect original beings which came into existence not by supernatural creation but by spontaneous generation according to the theory of evolution as elaborated by scientists the history of man begins with small animated particles or monera which appeared in the primeval sea these marine specks were albuminous compounds of carbon generated by the sun's heat 
which made their appearance as soon as the mists which enveloped the earth were sufficiently cleared away to permit the rays of the sun to penetrate them and reach the surface of the globe concerning the origin of the principle of life which these particles contained or regarding the development of organic bodies from inorganic substances the more timid among naturalists declare that in the present state of human knowledge it is impossible to know anything while others of them more bold or more confident of the latent powers of the human intellect after having elaborated a natural or mechanical explanation for the development of all organic forms are not disposed to accept a supernatural theory for the beginning of life for example since organic structures represent the development of matter according to laws governing the chemical molecular and physical forces inherent in it it is believed that the gulf separating organic and inorganic substances is not so difficult to span as has hitherto been supposed among these who hold this view may be ranked the celebrated naturalist ernst haeckel regarding the phenomena of life this writer observes we can demonstrate the infinitely manifold and complicated physical and chemical properties of the albuminous bodies to be the real cause of organic or vital phenomena indeed in whatever manner the vital force within them originated naturalists agree that from these particles have been derived all the forms both animal and vegetable which have ever existed upon the earth as speculations concerning the origin of matter lie without the domain of natural or scientific inquiry they form no part of the investigations of the naturalist so far as is known matter is eternal and all that may be learned concerning it must be gleaned by observing the changes chemical and molecular through which it is manifested by those who have observed the laws which govern the manifold changes in matter the fact is declared that the various manifestations in form and substance constitute the only creation of which we may have any knowledge and moreover that the genesis of existence is going on as actively in our time as at any previous period in the history of matter so far as human knowledge extends no particle of matter has ever been created and none ever destroyed this continuous process of transmutation of substance and change of form in other words the phenomena designated life may have been in operation during all the past and may continue forever as all speculations concerning the origin of matter have been unavailing so all attempts to solve the problem of the origin of life have proved futile the experiments recently carried on in the rockefeller institute in which by means of chemical processes detached organs from the bodies of animals have been made to perform their normal functions are interesting and instructive but these experiments furnish no clue to the origin of the force which animates living organic matter why the nucleated cells which we call a heart should pulsate whilst those which we call a liver should secrete bile nobody knows that all life on the earth has been derived from one or at most from a few original forms is said to be proved by ontogeny or the history of the germ which in its development passes through a number of the forms which mark the ascending scale of life through the study of comparative anatomy the fact has been discovered that the individuals composing the various orders of the great vertebrate series are all moulded on the same general plan that up to a certain stage in the development of the several germs for instance those of the man the ape the horse the dog and so on they are not distinguishable the one from the other and that it is only at a later stage of development that they take on the peculiarities belonging to their own special kind the number and variety of forms which appear in the animal and vegetable world make it difficult to conceive of the idea that all have sprung from one or at most from a few original types yet the chain of evidence in support of this theory seems quite complete natural selection by which it is demonstrated that organized matter must move forward simply through the chemical and physical forces inherent in it furnishes a key to all the phenomena of life both animal and vegetable which have ever appeared on the earth natural selection we are told 
depends for its operation on the interaction of two processes or agencies, namely inheritance and adaptation. Through inheritance, germs receive from their parents a plastic form, which, as all development is a function of external physical conditions, is itself nothing more than a manifestation of the remains of antecedent physical impressions. This inherited form causes them to go forward in a predestined course while through adaptation there is a constant tendency to change that predestined form imposed upon them by their parents to one better suited to their changing physical conditions. According to the theory of natural selection, organic structures vary to meet the requirements of changed conditions, or when existing circumstances are such that they are forced into new and unusual modes of life, they branch off into different directions. Thus, new varieties are formed or possibly new species such portions of a group however as remains sheltered from conditions unsuited to their present line of development retain their ancient forms this change of structure by which organisms or portions of organic bodies are modified so as to perform more complicated functions or those better suited to their environment is denominated differentiation Hence, the degree of differentiation attained by a structure determines the stage of development which it has reached. But to return to our single-celled animal, the simplest form of life on the earth, except that by the action of the surrounding forces its surface has become somewhat hardened, this little animal is the same throughout, in other words, it is homogeneous. The hardening of the outer portion constitutes the first process of differentiation, and therefore the first step in the order of progress. Comparing the simplest form of life, the little carbon sac found in the sea, with the germ from which animals and plants are derived, Haeckel says, Originally every organic cell is only a single globule of mucus, like a moniron, but differing from it in the fact that the homogeneous albuminous substance has separated itself into two different parts, a firmer albuminous body, the cell kernel, nucleus, and an external, softer albuminous body, the cell substance or body, protoplasma. From its body, which when at rest is nearly spherical, it is almost constantly casting forth certain finger-like processes which are as quickly withdrawn only to reappear on some other portion of its surface. The small particles of albuminous matter with which it comes in contact adhere to it or are drawn into its semi-fluid body by displacement of the several albuminous particles of which it is composed and are there digested, being absorbed by simple diffusion. Its only activity consists in supplying itself with nourishment, and even during this process it is said to display a negative or passive quality rather than real action. The particles absorbed that are not assimilated are expelled through the surface of the body in the same manner as they are taken into it. At first, we are told, our animal is only a simple cell, in fact, that it is not a perfect cell, for as yet the cell kernel or nucleus has not been separated from the cell substance or protoplasm. When its limit of size has been reached, it multiplies by self-division, or by simply breaking into parts, each part performing the same functions of nutrition and propagation as its predecessor. Later, however, when a parent cell bursts, the newly developed cells no longer separate from it, but, by cohering to it and to each other, form a cluster of nucleated cells, while around this aggregation of units is formed a wall. Still, its food is absorbed. Subsequently, however, a mouth and prehensile organs for seizing its food are developed, and the divisions between the cells are converted into channels or pipes through which nourishment is conveyed to every part of the body. In process of time, limbs for locomotion appear, together with bones for levers and muscles for moving them. Finally, a brain and a heart are evolved, and although at first the heart appears as only a simple pulsating vessel, later this animal finds itself the possessor of a perfect system of digestion, circulation, and excretion, by which food, after having been changed into blood, 
and aerated or purified by processes carried on in the system, is pumped to every part of the body. With the formation of different chemical combinations and the development through increasing specialization of the various kinds of tissues and finally of the various organs, that intimate relationship observed between the parts in homogeneous and less differentiated structures no longer exists. Hence, in response to the demand for communication between the various organs, numberless threads or fibers begin to stretch themselves through the muscles, and collecting in knots or centers in the brain and spine, establish instantaneous communication between the different parts and convey sensation and feeling throughout the entire organism. A division of labor has now been established, and each organ, being in working order and fashioned for its own special use, performs its separate functions independently, although its activity is coordinated with that of all other organs in the structure. This far in the history of life on the earth, sex has not been developed, or more correctly stated, as the two sexes have not been separated, our animal is still androgynous, or hermaphrodite, the reproductive functions being confined in one and the same individual. Within this little primeval animal, the progenitor of the human race, lay not only all the possibilities which have thus far been realized by mankind, but within it were embodied also the promise and potency of all that progress which is yet to come and of which man himself, in his present undeveloped state, may have only a dim foreshadowing. From the time of the appearance of life on the earth to that of the separation of the sexes, myriads of centuries may have intervened. Only when through a division of labor these elements became detached, and the special functions of each were confided to two distinct and separate individuals, did the independent history of the female and male sexes begin. No fact is more patent at the present time than that sex constitutes the underlying principle throughout nature, although it may not be said of the simplest forms of life that sexual difference has been established, yet we are assured that among the ciliated infusorians male and female nuclear elements have been distinguished. This primitive condition, however, is supposed to be rather a state antecedent to sex than a union of sexes in one organism. Among all the higher orders of life, whether animal or vegetable, the sex elements, female and male, are recognized as the two great factors in creation. As among all the animals in which there has been a separation of sexes, there has been established a division of labor, the consequent specialization of organs and the differentiation of parts form the true line of demarcation in the march of the two diverging columns. Doubtless, in the future, when our knowledge of the history of life on the earth has become more extended, it will be found that it is only by tracing the processes of differentiation throughout the two entire lines of development that we may hope to unravel all the mysteries bound up in the problem of sex, or to understand the fundamental differences in character and constitution caused by this early division of labor. End of section 1